Hello, Patrice Ranti. I'm Jazz Glanti, and welcome back to your favorite dental podcast. This one is really for the new dentists, new grads, or maybe you've been qualified for some while, but you're new to the world of clear aligners. And I know the title of this episode, and we discuss Invisalign a lot, is actually applicable to any clear aligner system, clear correct, or any, you name it. Uh, it's not specific to the Invisalign brand, but the lessons that me and Avi are going to share with you today can be applied to all of those different aligner systems. And essentially, it's about the challenges that we had at the very beginning. For example, I didn't know what to quote the patient in terms of which comprehensive or, or light or express, like which level of aligner therapy the patient needed, i.e. how many aligners the patient needed, how long the treatment would be, little tips for IPR, all these things I just didn't know, I didn't appreciate how to do your attachments. We're gonna discuss all of that in this episode. So essentially, this episode is the episode I wish I had when I was new to clear aligners or new to Invisalign. By the time you're listening to this, the app, the Protrusive app is actually out and it's being used by around about 185 beta testers. These are people who sign up to a splint course as a bonus like early you know fast action bonus if you sign up for splint course uh, in this time you get the protrusive premium so these people uh, qualified for first access to the app and they can now get CPD or CE certificates for all the episodes uh, you know as then when they listen they can now answer some questions and get certificates emailed to them by my team as well as lots of other perks on the app but when I release the app for general sale I will let you know so those of you who've been asking me about hey when's the app coming out well it's out it's just being used by a very exclusive bunch as we get it fine-tuned and perfected, ready for general sale, coming to you soon. The podcast is free and will always be free. Some concerns I have is that some of the things that I discuss with my guests, I don't want patients to, to see it or hear it. This is like dentist talk, right? There are some things we just want to keep between us dentists, like we're talking about fee setting uh, and complexity planning, that kind of stuff. It's probably best that it's not on a public forum like YouTube. So the position or the role that the app's going to have in the future is, again, you can access it for free. If you want to get certificates, yeah, you got to pay for it. But if you want to actually watch the videos that won't be made public, the app will be the best best place to do that. So more information to follow soon. Before we join the main episode, let me give you the protrusive pearl for today. Because we're talking about clear aligners, let's talk about planning your clear aligner movements or for all intents and purposes, the clean check for those who use Invisalign. When you're planning your movements, there's something called hyper correction. So for example, let's say you have a rotated upper lateral incisor, very common. And uh, let's just even back up a little bit and talk about um, how you describe a rotation. You know, something I didn't appreciate when I was starting out, how do you actually describe a rotated tooth? So imagine you have a rotated lateral incisor. The easiest way to describe it is distal out or distal in or mesial in or mesial out. And it's kind of self-explanatory what that means. Just visualize it, okay? If a lateral incisor is mesial out, you know that the mesial side of it is going buckly. It's like flaring outwards. Now saying mesial out is the same as saying distal in. It's a quick and easy way to describe a rotation. The other way to do it would be if a tooth is rotated mesial buccally, you know that the mesial portion of that lateral incisor is rotated more towards the buckle. But it's easier to say mesial out than mesial buckle. So I like like mesial in, mesial out, distal in, distal out. And that's how you describe rotations very easily. Now, why is that relevant? So rotations are pesky movements. They are difficult movements. When you're rotating teeth, that's when uh, tracking can get lost. And especially on lateral incisors, smaller teeth, this is where you're gonna slip up a little bit. So one way you can kind of improve the predictability or get a better outcome is hypercorrect. What that means is that if a lateral incisor, for example, as the example tooth, could be any rotated tooth or any movement for any tooth, let me explain. If a lateral incisor is mesial out and you want to bring it mesial in and, and, and correct the rotation, in your clin check, if you finish with the tooth perfectly well aligned, then maybe by the end of treatment, because the rotation movement is not 100% predictable, you'll finish the aligners with it being not quite perfect. It's still gonna be a tiny bit measle out. Now, if you hypercorrect, it means that you go from a scenario where you start off mesial out because that's the malocclusion, and then on the clinch check, you're gonna correct it. But actually, you're not gonna correct it until it's perfect. You're gonna correct it until it's actually gone the other way. It's gonna go distal out or, or mesial in. 
and you've overdone it. You've overcorrected the rotation or hypercorrected it. So don't worry. It doesn't mean that your patient's going to end up with uh, a tooth that's rotated the other way now. That's very unlikely. By doing that hypercorrection and making the clincheck look worse off in the other direction means that you're more likely to finish with perfect alignment. So this is called hypercorrection. So for example, if you know that your lateral incisor needs 10 degrees of rotation, why don't you just add in 13 degrees of rotation? So hypercorrect that movement, make it look slightly worse at the end, and you're more likely to correct that rotation. So this is called hypercorrection. It's also really good to use in deep bite cases. So a lot of your deep bite clean checks, they may finish with anterior open bites at the end. And of course, you, the patient with a deep bite will never finish with an anterior open bite at the end. But if you show that on the clean check, it's kind of like showing you the, the, the forces that you're placing on the teeth. Now, if you need more inspiration or knowledge regarding that area, do check out episode 71 with Dr. Farooq Ahmed. We geeked out about this. We talked about all the do's and don'ts of aligners and what, are, what movements are predictable and which movements are not predictable. So once you've listened to this episode and you're hungry for actual orthodontic knowledge when it comes to biomechanics of aligners, I would definitely check out episode 71 because Farouk covers that so well. In this episode, we're going to start from the basics, like, you know, you're a brand new Invisalign provider. Uh, and the reason I'm making this is I kind of wish I had this when I was starting out. So I'm hoping this helps you. Uh, I'll catch you in the outro. This episode is brought to you by Enlighten Smiles, which is the premium brand of teeth whitening. There's loads of reasons I use and like Enlighten. One of them is that they guarantee B1 in your Viveras. So going on with the theme of this podcast episode, you know, Invisalign, clear aligner therapy, if you're using Viveras already, Enlighten offer the guarantee with their own whitening trays, which are super sealed, but they offer it with Viveras because Viveras are tightly sealed. So if you're already in lots of Viveras and you want to give the patient uh, a guaranteed result, you should definitely consider using Enlighten. Now, if you want to learn more about the system or just generally you want to geek out and learn about teeth whitening in general, the science of teeth whitening and getting better results for your patients, do check out their webinar run by Payman Langrudi. It's on protrusive.co.uk for slash enlighten. Dr. Avi Patel, welcome to the Protrusive Dental Podcast. How are you, my friend? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm very good. It was nice to connect with you on Instagram. We were talking about uh, Invisalign primarily, but let's call it clear aligner therapy, okay? You can obviously, we're going to talk about Invisalign, but you know, when we say Invisalign, we're talking about clear aligners. And what I liked about you was that you uh, over the last few years, we were having a little chat before I hit the record button. You've done a high volume of cases. You've uh, got uh, got into nitty gritty of of treating your patients and 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 seeing all the sort of issues that can come along the way and and power through them. But also, you're you're fresh enough that you can remember the challenges of when you're starting out. So you got the you, you get the best of both worlds there. But for those who don't know your story, just uh, tell us a little bit about you, how you got involved with doing a uh, high volume of aligner work, uh, and the kind of dentistry that excites you? Yeah. Um, so I graduated dental school in 2018. I went to NYU. And uh, when I graduated, I was living in the city, but commuting out to Connecticut. So they have a rule in New York where if you want to practice there, you have to either do a one-year residency or you have to have two years of working experience in a different state. So I just wanted to kind of get out there, start working. Honestly, I just was tired of school and I felt like I could learn more in the real world. So I, I did. I dove in and um, it had its challenges, but it was, I think, a good learning experience because I was able to be in multiple practices. And uh, it, it just looking back now, it exposed me to many different ways of dentistry. I think, you know, when we're in school, you tend to assume that practice owners kind of know everything and have everything together. Uh, but every practice owner has their own challenges, right? So for me to get that, you know, I, I, I called it my real world residency where it's, you know, these are different offices operating differently. And each one, I learn something from them, right? At the end of the day, you know, not every associateship lasted that long just because of different challenges, fits, stuff like that. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I just tried to keep a positive, a positive mindset for as long as I could. And then two years go by and I'm finally kind of leveled out in a couple practices. Uh, I was working at two at the time and then the pandemic hits. So pandemic hits and, you know, everyone kind of pauses, you're reflecting, you're going through all the, all the stages of uh, what lockdown does to you as a human. And, um, you know, part of it for me, I, I dove into CE. Right. I was like, you know what, let me just use this time and just learn because I was starting to get a little 
I guess, bored of this is the bread and butter. Um, and I was looking for a little bit more dentistry to do because I, at that point, I felt like if I can do more, I can offer more, maybe that'll excite me. And it, and, um, yeah, so I took an implant course and then I dove into Invisalign. Um, NYU certifies us. That's why I didn't pick a different, uh, you know, brand to go with. So I was already certified. Wait, so, so you qualify from NYU with your, is it, excuse, excuse my ignorance, uh, DDS? Right. Correct. Or DDS, DMD, yeah, yeah, DDS. And then with your DDS, you just get thrown. Hey, you can do Invisalign now. So Is that right? yeah. So so it, so in the <laughs> curriculum, it was oh, it was a joke. Uh, it was like modules, and like we had a class to go to, but it was the click through modules. There was no like, hey, let's teach you. When you got into clinic in dental school, you could actually do a case, but it was the most difficult thing it was so complex you had to schedule specific time with one faculty member and you had to align their schedule with the patients and they did the whole like paper full facial analysis bite like just overcomplicated it and it was just i mean the only benefit is that i didn't have to pay the three thousand dollars when i got out of school to get certified <laughs> that's that's all i want to know do you save three grand yeah. or not you save the three grand. Saved, amazing well my well my tuition <laughs> my tuition was through the roof so i'm sure i paid for it <laughs> for my dental school tuition <laughs> Um, Very true. But yeah. So it didn't I mean, really on, on that note, Avi, it's, it's worth addressing this, which is, um, and you kind of touched on it a little bit now, whereby when you have Invisalign accreditation, i.e. you go on the course to learn Invisalign, a lot of dentists, when I was at my accreditation in, I think it was like 2017, like a lot of dentists came there expecting to learn orthodontics at the same time as learning uh, Invisalign as a system. And they went away hugely disappointed because actually Invisalign never has said they'll teach you orthodontics. They, they, mm. they don't promise that. They don't never will. They are someone who's going to give you the tools and they assume that you have prior orthodontic knowledge or you're going to get some mentorship. So I think that's really important that uh, the, the new dentist who, who are considering uh, dabbling or learning about aligners that they need to get some sort of education regarding orthodontics. So where did you learn your orthodontics from is what I'm trying to ask. And, and what would you advise uh, young dentists? Yeah. So, you know, I, I basically, basically took the mod. I mean, I'll be like brutally honest. I did the modules online. I did all like the videos. Um, and then basically I was just like, I, all I want to know, I didn't necessarily understand all of the orthodontics behind it, but I was determined to make it work. And I just, basically I was like, I want to know what is predictable, right? What are cases that I can do? What are cases that I should not do? Um, and then essentially, right. Giving me like the guardrails to kind of stick to. And then, um, I reached out and I made sure I had support, uh, in terms of getting help with clin checks and stuff like that. So that's it. Again, I know that doesn't sit well with a lot of people because, you know, that's, it, it can be scary. Um, but again, I was This young, is the real world. Like, what you said was is a real world GDP, general dentist issue, whereby we qualify, we have some basic, you know, screening and assessment knowledge in orthodontics. And then suddenly we're on this $3,000 course uh, in Visline and now we can, um, we're armed with this power to, to give aligners to patients. And then we need to recognize that A, okay, we perhaps need more education and mentorship, but B, you also need to... Um, make sure that you put f uh, food on the plate. And so you need to actually pay the bills and actually do some orthrontics as well. So, so it's Correct. a fine balance. But the, the, I think the main message is, yeah, find the mentorship, find the education. Don't expect yourself just from having gone to the Invisalign accreditation course to actually give you any mm -hmm. superior knowledge on diagnosis, assessment and treatment planning when it comes to orthrontics. Correct. And that's the thing in this space right now with clear aligners is you hit it on the nail. They are expecting you, right, to have that, that knowledge um, before you use their systems. But I also just think as a general dentist, if you know your, I call it your lane, if you know your lane and you know what you can tackle and what you can treat and it's sitting in all of our practices, right? It's the simple crowding, spacing, right? Like the basic stuff that you can still make a huge difference. If you focus on that, you're going to get comprehensive care to your patients, right? You're going to be able to pay the bills because your production is going to go through the roof. And it's just a very, it's a great service. I feel like in today's day and age, a lot of patients here in America, at least I know the UK has their stigmas for people not caring about their oral health, but you know, people here are like begging for Invisalign. Like you have doctors that are doing two to three cases a month. And I know that they're only doing two to three cases a month because they're, I just, I always ask them like, are you actively talking about it or are your patients asking you for it? And they all say, oh, my patients ask for it. I'm like, exactly. So that's a whole nother subset that we can kind of get into later. But, um, 
Yeah, I think it's uh, it's huge and it's critically important for for general dentists to know that that you you can't just take one course, you can't just get certified. You have to dive into this, and that's what I did. Um, you know, I'm and not that was in Austin, get... Texas. I mean, you, you didn't get to that bit where you went to Texas. You found a, a mini corporate. You said that 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 yeah. allowed you to fuel this passion and discover uh, your uh, you know your space in the liners and, and and how you enjoy doing that. But uh, one thing I want to know is that you did the implant course first. Are you still placing implants are you placing implants now or not so yeah i guess we go back to the story i finished up connecticut moved to austin joined the mini corporate spot um and then they basically gave me free reign they were like hey do whatever you want we'll support you here's an itero you know we have a nobel implant you know extra hands-on course you can take so i just i did it all i started placing implants um sticking to the basics right you're you know nine uh, lower molars upper premolars nothing really too complex and um it was a lot more of a steady growth. I still do place implants, but honestly, not as many. Um, I think I I feel like my my growth skyrocketed with Invisalign faster than with implants. So I haven't abandoned it, but that's just kind of where my practice is at right now. Um, is your patient demographic uh, younger, older? Give us a paint a picture of that. So this demographic is like state employees, fifties, um, sixties. Uh, I'd say my average patient is like in their 50s or 60s. So it's not even like, in my opinion, the sweet spot, which is like your 30 year olds, right? Um, so this is like a tough spot. And like the office I'm at, but is like, it's old. It's like, I think the office is older than me, honestly. Um, but uh, if you go about it in a certain way, and I think if you embody the mindset of, hey, this isn't just an added service, this is part of what I do, right? Being definitive, when you see a cavity that goes to the nerve, that needs a root canal and a crown. There's no question. When you see crowded teeth, spacing, any issues like that, you know, malocclusion, hey, you have misaligned teeth, you need clear aligners. This is what we're doing. That is how you ramp up everything. Um, but again, that comes, you have to have confidence. You can't, you, you just start saying that now you got to treat it, right? And it's like, okay, what, what can I treat? What can I not treat? Well, we can definitely yeah. cover a little bit about, about that today. And one thing I will ask you later is, uh, can you remember a time in your eagerness or early stages of uh, doing Invisalign where you treated a case uh, and you didn't anticipate how difficult it might be or, or why perhaps you shouldn't have treated that specific type of malocclusion? And me personally, I can tell you straight away, I treated, uh, I treated a posterior crossbite once where I just shouldn't have touched it. Uh, there was yeah. no reason for me to touch it. It was not aligned with the patient goals. Can you think of a time where you treated someone and uh, you perhaps broke a basic rule? Yeah, um, I would say I took on a deep bite case that I probably shouldn't have taken. <laughs> uh, I didn't understand. I didn't realize, you know, the. I mean, intrusion is the most difficult movement to do with clear aligners. Period, um, especially in adults, right? So, um, yeah, I just didn't know, but I set the patient's expectations accordingly, right? The thing that we all have to. This is my philosophy. You have to get used to. When you have an adult and you're trying to move their teeth with plastic, that does not mean that you cannot improve their situation, right? You can. So if you are coming from a place of function, health, and improving, the clear liners will check all those boxes. It's as dentists, we get hung up, I think, on perfection. And I'm not saying to not strive for perfection, always strive for it, but we also have to be realistic. These are humans. These are, you know, these are teeth that, you know, you can control a certain amount. Like you don't know if a tooth is ankylosed and stuff like that before. There's so many variables. So you can't let these challenges stop you from actually, you know, offering the services. Where I'm getting at with this is I realize with my patients, I'm not selling them on a perfect, perf like a perfect smile. I'm not selling them on cosmetics. I am educating them about the oral health implications and how we can improve that. Like, my patients come out of uh, clear liners able to floss and they're like, doc, I can floss. Like this is actually not that bad. Like before I used to shred my floss, so I stopped doing it. And now they're like, I do it and you can tell. So it's, that's, it's a mental shift, um, which is, you know, a message that I'm trying to kind of get out there. Uh, Cause I think everybody wins, right? It's, it's, you can improve someone's life by 98%. Yes, it's not 100%, but don't beat yourself up for that 2% that you missed out on because of all the other growth that you had. Well said. And uh, on the topic of a deep bite case, I had seen a few of my colleagues struggle with that because they, they go in and what they do, they show the patient the ClinCheck and the ClinCheck, it finishes up as like, you know, beautiful mm -hmm. two millimeters over, over bite, over jet. And then 
what they don't realize is that the clincheck, and we'll come on to this later, is a representation of the forces that are applied to the tooth, not an actual, this is how it's going to end up. You know, the clincheck is essentially yes. car- cartoon odontics, as I heard someone say once. So that's going to that's be a, a big issue. So I know one of my colleagues, Farouk, eh, what, eh, what he taught me was that if you're going to hypercorrect the, the deep bite, i.e. make it look like a finish with an anterior open bite in your clincheck to, in, in a mm. way to help the predictability of, of getting some further degree of an, uh, deep bite correction. But you, you show the patient, not the final outcome, you show the patient like, you know, halfway through and say, look, this is roughly where we're going to end up with a deep bite. And if you do that, yeah. rather than sending the patient the animation and when they're going to, you know, beautifully correct the deep bite, then you're asking for trouble. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, that's a huge thing. I didn't even know that when I first started. So, but that, that's, that's great advice to hypercorrect. Uh, honestly, kind of my protocol is if it's a deep bite greater than four millimeters, I don't even touch it. That goes to the orthodontist. Like I'm an advocate to referring to orthodontists. I, like, you know, we were saying earlier, I, I kind of know how to stay in my lane um, and I've figured out what is treatable, what's not. And then there's that gray area where if the patient is super wanting to do it, it's like, ah, oh, okay, I guess we'll, we'll give it a shot. But you, you set the expectations accordingly, right? Hey, this is something we can improve. It's going to be challenging. If you're willing to you know, comply where the aligners, this may take longer than the six to eight months that my cases usually take. But if you want to do it, we can do it. And if you're up front with the patient, right, it takes that pressure off of you. And, and they also are able to... Um, comprehend that and they'll know. So they're not going to be upset if it takes a year. But yeah. Well, well, two great points there. One is, yeah, patient communication. Don't, you know, uh, undersell, over deliver kind of thing, which is really important, but also staying in your lane again and knowing that, okay, this Mm -hmm. is beyond my comfort zone and there's plenty more cases out there for you as a, as a, as a you know, beginner dentist in Bizline for those listening maybe uh, and you don't have to treat everything that comes your way and definitely use that referral uh, and I think I always say the best thing about being a GDP and, and the specialists may want to just shut their ears here with their listening to this is the best thing about being a GDP is cherry picking right we can just yeah. cherry pick the cases and, that, and that let's uh, GDPs we have the most difficult job in the world as well in, in the world of dentistry uh, and, and, and maybe even the world okay let's go with that uh, we have the most difficult job in the world uh, and, and, and and therefore, let's let's enjoy the, the benefit of, of cherry picking. But the, the the main thing is four four main things I want to, I want, I want you to, four lessons I want you to pass on in terms of when we're starting out with um, Invisalign or clear liners. I remember my journey. Um, it, it comes to a point where your patient is interested. You've done your diagnosis and whatnot. You've had that conversation. Patient's excited, and now the patient wants to know how much it's going to cost. And so. In your mind, as, as a new uh, Invisalign provider, you're like, okay, I'm not quite sure if there's going to be a light within 14 liners or a comprehensive, like unlimited liners, and you're not quite mm-hmm. sure. But to, to the patient on the other end of that, the difference that you quote in terms of uh, comprehensive and, and light, not for all, but for some, it may be the make or break in terms of whether they can afford it or, or go ahead with it. So before right. they invest in the clincheck, they need to be given a ballpark figure. So uh, the question essentially I'm asking is, as young dentists who haven't treated enough cases to know exactly which level of, of a line is, you know, light or comprehensive uh, the patient's going to need, how do you communicate that to the patient? What, do you always quote the highest fee? And then if it's a lower, it's a bonus. What do you advise? So um, we'll get into little sales tips here. But basically, I like to keep it simple, right? The whole thing about being a provider is you have to be confident from the start, right? Your patient will see when you are not confident. This was a, ch- this is actually one of the hurdles that before I even moved to Austin and I was still practice, uh, practicing my first two years out of school, this is one of the reasons why I didn't even start. I, I, I didn't start cases because I was like, I don't know. Is this a go? Is this a light? Is this comprehensive? So it's very common. Um, so, but then once I got the advice of, hey, every case is comprehensive, right? That might perk people's ears up. Uh, and I'm going to explain why, but that's that's kind of the that's the way I do it, right? So to answer the question, every case is comprehensive, but how do you get there? Well, when you when you start, again, come from a place of providing value, right? How are clear aligners going to impact the patient's oral health, right? You start listing the issues. You show them if you have an itero, show them the crowded teeth, show them the inflammation, um, show them the wear, all that stuff. Dentists like to think that we can like, I mean, which we are. We're, we're great at speaking to patients and talking about stuff, but what we don't, what sometimes we forget is the patient has no idea what some of the stuff we're saying. Oh, crowding, wear this. Like, that's why I love the itero. You put that sucker up there. 
you show them and you, you got the colors, you got everything. And then it's very obvious, right? Any person understands at that point what you're saying. So if you have an iTero, start doing those scans because that is going to build your value, right? You don't have to say as much. You're showing. And so I come from that place. So already it is now, okay, I'm listening because the dentist is talking to me about my oral health, right? They are not talking to me about cosmetics. They're not talking to me about the way I look. I, it's This might you know, dentists may not agree, but my opinion is most people don't really care how their teeth look. Okay. It's not something that they're willing to spend. Not everyone is willing to spend $5,000, you know, to improve the looks, but you start I, talking I think in to our de demographic, Avi, because you said your patients are, you know, 50, 60, same here. In fact, the last two clinic checks I did uh, last week, patient 72 and patient 68, my actual clinic checks in my last two. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I have a way uh, older demographic and uh, I, I agree with you. Most of them, when we did have that conversation, it's usually because the, the, the teeth are quite worn at the front and so it's an, an, it's an envelope of function issue that they're, they're, they're now coming mm -hmm. around treating or lower in size of crowding and, and the, the calculus and easy to clean and they're coming from that angle and, and I'm there look I'm going to make things look nice while I'm there but I know that your prime motivation is to sort this out or sort that out and how that relates function. to uh, function and health and so I agree with the, an older dem demographic maybe with a younger one with the marketing and stuff and t the world of TikTok and stuff maybe there is obviously uh, a cosmetic you know people coming in for cosmetic you know composite veneers and in this land there's a huge yeah. market in the UK for, for that kind of stuff so yeah I think uh, in every demographic, you have a, a different focus, I guess. You're right. No, definitely. But I do think even if you're so it's even easier when it's a younger demographic, because now they're already thinking cosmetics and you give them a valid health reason why they're like, done, I'm doing it right. Because mm -hmm. dentists and physicians, the biggest difference is like, you know, people are like, oh, dentists, they're just car salesmen. They're just car salesmen. They're just trying to upsell me. And it's like, no, like the stuff we're doing is for your oral health. Like it's for your health, right? And that impacts the rest of your body. People don't question physicians when they say stuff because it's an association of health, right? And improving it. So when we come from that same standpoint, um, these more expensive cases, that the more expensive procedures, um, you have to build that value. Otherwise, to them, they're like, oh, my insurance doesn't cover it. I'm not doing it, this or that, right? So start from there. You build it out. So you have that box checked, they understand the value of it, right? So now they don't really know how much it's gonna cost, but they understand why they need it and why it's important. That's huge. And if you don't do that, then you're not gonna be able to even get to the next step. So let's assume you've communicated that. Now, um, is it gonna be a light, go, or comprehensive? The reason why I say everything should be a comprehensive is because one, when you have comprehensive, you have more control of the case, right? So I know when you're starting out, you may not understand why you would need all that control or all that power, but you want it because the text, when you use like the go or the light, the text that you're talking to don't really actually know. Like you think that the person on the other side is like has your best interests in mind and like is able to like construct this perfect clinic check? No, you have to be the provider and you have to actually dictate the movement. And I'm sure when you had Dr. Bethel on here, he said the same thing where, you know, you have to, you have to communicate it as the doctor. So with go, okay, can, I just want uh, to interject there because literally today uh, we have a telegram group for the Petrusa uh, and um, a dentist who used to message about um, a, a dubious prognosis, second lower second premolar. I'm saying it in this way because uh, American numbering and you know, British numbering is, is different for teeth. Let's say yeah. we both understand lower second premolar, yeah? So lower second <laughs> premolar of, of dubious prognosis uh, and then she was suggesting that uh, let me send in this um, scan and impression to Invisalign and, and then um, instead of doing lots of IPR, um, uh, I maybe Invisalign will suggest to me to extract this tooth, and I said, "Well, mm. well, well hold up, no, no, you decide whether you're going to extract the tooth or not." You, you know, Invisalign will not. They will, if you want them to align it, they will just align everything. They'll expand everything. They'll align it. The extraction choice and decision is made by you as a clinician. Correct. So just very much to make it very tangible. Yes, agreed. The technician is there just to uh, follow some protocols. You are the, the the captain of the ship, and you must steer exactly how you want it. And a lot of these, you know, as much as we hate to think about it. The technician, the Invisalign technician at the end of the end, we may think that, oh, yeah, they know what they're doing, and they do. But essentially, when you actually see these guys, what they're doing is that they're, they're literally there selecting the teeth uh, tooth by tooth, and then they're making them look straight. Okay, they're straight now. Uh, they look nice now. Next. Um, and that's they it. No consideration of the... That, yeah, yeah, there's no consideration of biotype, uh, occlusion. Yes, they have their basic guidances and stuff, but they really need the direction from us. Absolutely. Correct. And so again, 
you know, earlier dentists right now, don't let this scare you. This is not meant to be scary. It's just letting you know how to look at this so you can go about it in the right way, right? So um, you go comprehensive, you have that ability. Now, the difference between go and comprehensive is Invisalign go does not move the molars, right? Uh, it doesn't move the molars and you're limited to 20 trays and then one set of refinement. Now, that's ideal. Like most of my cases are 20 trays or less. Um, you know, I've taken Dr. Galler's course. He's, um, he's teaches re-engage and, it, and it's this philosophy of not moving the molars, you know, focusing on a little bit more IPR. But the reason is because um, when you move molars, you increase the chances of a posterior open bite. Right. So I know there's a bunch of different philosophies out there. That's the way that I've kind of committed to and works. And it's in this realm of like a six to eight month kind of treatment time. You get in, you treat the patient and then, you know, everyone goes on to retainers. But with comprehensive, you can do the same thing. You can mark the molars and you can just say, don't move these teeth. Right. You have that ability in the prescription to now. So now that automatically eliminates go in that regard. And the advantage is with comprehensive, you get unlimited trays for five years. Okay. Now, why is that important? When you have a patient that just finished, and even if it only takes six to eight months, it doesn't matter. 20, let's say they took 20 trays. They're done. They're in their retainers. Two years later, they lose their retainers, their teeth shift, right? This happens, right? People get lazy with retainers. This is called relapse. We all know it. Um, they come in in two years, and then now they're like, hey, doc, uh, my teeth moved. What do we do? So would you at that point feel more comfortable telling the patient, yes, uh, let's do go again because you ran out of, right? You don't have, let's do go again. Give me another 3000 or whatever it is you're charging. Or would you just like to be like, hey, no problem. We'll just do a scan. We'll get you new retainers and you're just back in the trace, right? So it's that added value. And then I even sometimes will mention to patients that are a little weary of pricing. I say, hey, listen, this is like almost like a warranty for you, right? It's an insurance built into the cost. Um, and patients get more comfortable. Whereas the go, um, it can get, you know, hairy and that no one likes having those conversations where, you know, it's, they're like, oh, well, my teeth moved. Like, yeah, but you just did it. This only happened two years ago. Right. And they're just like, oh, well, you got to pay again. And then it's just, it's not, it's not good. So that's kind of where, and I've been in that situation where not even the lengthwise, but, uh, it, I thought it was going to take 20 trays. But they needed, you know, two sets of refinement. And then now we're talking about money again. Hey, I need another thousand dollars because, you you know, your teeth didn't move the way they were supposed to. So just eliminate those headaches, go to comprehensive, um, you know, and, and it'll just make your life easier. I, I think that's great advice. And uh, I, at the beginning, I actually, for my first 10 clean checks, I used this like um, ClinCheck advisory service. Uh, I think it was Invisible TX, uh, and um, the, the guy helped me with my invis my clean checks at the beginning because I was I was learning. I wanted to make sure I was doing it right and whatnot. Uh, and then I, I emailed him one saying, "Hey, I don't know whether I should do this uh, patient in uh, within the confines of light. It was like fourteen liners or, or comprehensive." And and he actually said, "Depends how fussy your patient is." And I was like, "Wow, I never I never thought about it that way." But I like the advice you give. That okay. And I think the the advice to echo here for those listening and watching is. If you are on the fence, don't even think about it. Go comprehensive if you're on the fence. So yeah. if it's like a really obvious, clear, like a you know minor, really minor crowding, it's going to be sorted well within 10 liners and you get up to 14, then fine. But if you get a really fussy patient for a reason or you're on the fence, I think that's great. Uh, not only because of the the warranty thing that you said about, you know, relapse happens mm. and stuff. But the thing I love most about it is the thing that you said right at the beginning is that you need to be confident when you're communicating to a patient. And I know that I've disserviced my patients in the past at the consultation where I've looked and I've made that face. And I thought, you know what? I'm not. Yeah, you make that face. It could be, yeah, be, 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 be 5,000. It could be 4,000. Ah, I don't know. And then the patient's like, okay, this, this guy doesn't know what he's doing. You know, I yep. knew what I was doing, but I was just like, you I was knew. trying to find out what to quote them. So um, yes. I think for that reason I think it's wonderful advice I think just just go comprehensive and I think you can't go wrong with that so if you're on the fence definitely go comprehensive that is a, a very very good way to answer that question I think a lot of people would have gained value from that I wish I knew that uh, earlier in my career uh, anything you want to add to that before I go to the next question I was just going to say I like how you said that where you know I think in the beginning you start comprehensive and then as you get more comfortable you know what's predictable because you do the more cases you see you see how the teeth move okay and then you get that confidence hey we just did this and that you just know that'll take about 14. That'll take about 20. Um, so then you can start scaling it back. But to your point, um, I like that. Unless you know, uh, stick to the comprehensive. Very good. And uh, you mentioned refinement earlier. Uh, it'd be really good for I mean, I, one of my uh, colleagues, one of my bosses, actually, when he started Invisalign, 
he didn't know about refinement. He literally was like, okay, um, they either get there or they don't in their first round. And then he, he realized that patients weren't quite happy. And he's like, what's going on here? Oh, there's something called refinement. Uh, and cause that he, he wasn't told that at the, at the course. Uh, so, so he tells me. And so um, when I told him that, hey, a lot of my cases go to refinement and, and that's kind of normal, you know? And he's mm-hmm. like, oh, is that, is that, you know, he didn't know that. So uh, I'd love to learn from you what percentage of your cases go to refinement. Uh, and would you like to suggest to those listening, those uh, newbie dentists uh, starting out with the line that that is, yeah, is, is that a normal thing? Is it expected? And uh, how can we gauge that? Yeah, that's a great question. I think when I first started out, so first of all, I don't even know what the word refinement meant. <laughs> like, Wait, oh, it's additional school, aligners now, obviously, and they call it additional aligners. But yeah, I mean, correct. refinement, additional aligners, we're, we're talking about the same thing here. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And it's, yeah, I still call it refinement. But it, when I first started, I was like, I don't even know what this word means. Um, but um, yeah, so it's a mental hurdle to get over. But I think, again, all of this is mentality based to boost confidence. So I felt bad that they weren't finishing and getting to where they needed to be in 20 trays right in the beginning i felt bad i was like damn like oh god we gotta we gotta do more aligners right um like it's a failure uh meanwhile we've just corrected the severe crowding and like we're just tweaking the end right so i think once you understand that um that it's expected um you know again some clinicians they take pride in a very you know minimal refinement percentage i'm gonna be honest like a lot of my cases do go to refinement. Um, But it's okay, because I have already communicated that ahead of time, I don't tell the patients, hey, you're going to be done in 20. No, you say at the consultation, this will be about six to eight months, right? Depends on and then if you want to go further, because they have questions, say, look, there's a bunch of factors, you have to wear the trays 22 hours a day, otherwise, the treatment will take longer, right? And, And you have to come to your appointments, all this and all that, right? So you you build that in the beginning so that way they're aware because most patients, the really good ones, wear it for 22 hours a day and this stuff works, right? It's the ones that are a little lazy and they're not um, that you'll see. And it's like, oh, well, we're at the end and this could be better. So don't take the onus, all of it. It's not your fault. It's it's It could be that the patient wasn't wearing the trays and that's okay, right? Um, they know they have to wear more trays or they're going to say, hey, I'm done. Put me in the retainers. I'm done with this stuff. I've had patients do that too. And I'm like, well, we could still improve this. And they're like, is it better functionally or not? And I'm like, yeah, it's definitely better functionally. But, And then they're like, okay, well, I don't want to wear the trays anymore. Like, okay, fine. Because at that point, you know, it's it, it's their choice too, right? So, yeah. With I mean, so, de- so definitely don't say, for those watching listening, definitely don't say to the patient, okay, it's going to be, you know, 25 aligners, as you can see in the clinic check, and then we'll be done and then be disappointed at the end. Uh, and then refinements are expected. And I say they're expected, and then sometimes yeah. you get lucky. And I said they're expected because we know that orthodontic movements are not 100% predictable. You know, tipping mm-hmm. is, uh, you know, 70, 80% predictable or thereabouts. Um, everything has, a, you know, uh, rotations, you know, 50% predictable ability. You know, I'll have to listen to that um, episode with Farouk again to, to memorize the figures. But we know it's not predictable, so we can't say that within one round, even if you hypercorrect and stuff. So I always say to my patients, we do it in different rounds. Or I sometimes say it's like playing golf. You, you know, sometimes you get a hole in one, but most of the time you get a little bit closer to the hole, and those little Correct. minor changes at the end, little tweaks, uh, we'll get those right. And I say to my patients, sometimes I'm gonna be the one pestering you, say, can I please do this? And I'll, I'll beg you to let me align. And sometimes <laughs> you'll be like, you know what, that little movement, and this is what we're here for. We want to get w- both of us happy. So, so that's the kind of arrangement I say at the consultation, so that they know yeah. that the first 20 aligners, fine, it's there, but they know that they're gonna have more. And then back to your point about the timeline. Yes, it's more about the time line rather than you know additional uh, aligners and whatnot so my next question therefore is so you answered very well that if you're unsure about which band they're going to be in just say comprehensive but what Mm -hmm. about the newbie dentist who doesn't know how long movements take yet how do you then give the patient a range or like in this case six to eight months six to eight months uh, 12 months any guide that you have to to actually tell the patient how long the treatment duration might be so that all comes down to the type of cases you are working on, right? It's all case selection. So going back to what I was saying, staying in your lane, knowing what you can treat, right? Your crowding, spacing, anterior open bite, stuff like that. If you're only treating those, you're only going to be in a six, it's going to be six to eight months. That's just how it works, right? Because you're not moving these massive molars and doing all like this, like posterior double, like you shouldn't be doing <laughs> double posterior cross, but you can do singular, uh, but don't do double. And even singular, like if they're functional and they're fine, you don't have to necessarily improve it, right? Um, I learned that the hard way, yes. <laughs> yeah, so you, 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 you kind of set yourself up, but that's the other, like 
it's my case selection it then trickles down to like, okay, since we're only doing this, it'll be six to eight months. And then that's kind of how I do it. Has there been patients that have gone a little bit past eight months? Yes. But again, it's because, you know, they admitted they weren't wearing the trays or, you know, they said, you know, there was a tooth that was just really tough to move. And when you see them at the checks, you kind of give them updates and they are, they, they're okay with it. It's not as scary as you'd think. I think we mm-hmm. forget when you ask patients in braces um, that are seeing an orthodontist, they say, oh, it might be two years, a year or whatever. Like they don't know. The orthodontists keep moving the teeth until they get it to where they mm-hmm. want. There's no like – dentists, I think we just like, oh, yeah, we prep the crown today. We deliver it in two weeks. Like it's just very – you know, but that's not how ortho is. It's it's there's a lot more variables. So you got to be comfortable think, uh, with that. Uh, agreed. And I think I want to add to that and say that, you know, if you think it's going to be six to eight months, just say nine months. You know, it, the patients will yeah. be happy when there's it no finishes early. There's, there's no, no harm. harm. Undersell. Oh, no one's ever said, what, nine months? The dentist down the road said eight months. You know, but no one's ever said that, right? They said, okay, fine, nine months. I can deal with that. It's not going to make a huge difference in terms of uh, how it is. And it just gives you a little bit of breathing space. Uh, and mm-hmm. I think two times, I've reg- a few times I've regretted taking cases on was um, A, Bridezilla, where she's, you know, she's getting married oh, and yeah. like, you know, just be very careful <laughs> with those ones. Uh, uh, and then also when the patient's like, oh, I'm going to, uh, I'm, I'm moving to New Zealand in, in six, six months. Do you think we can get this right? Don't do that. It's just no, not worth it. Go have it. your treatment done in New Zealand. It just puts too much pressure on you and then trying to fit them around when you're busy and stuff. So I think, would you agree that those two kind of cases, just be careful, tread carefully? Correct. Absolutely. And that's the thing is you have to do this information gathering in the beginning, right? Kind of get their expectations, see what they want to do, tell them what you see because um, this stuff comes out. Yeah, don't. Don't take the breath. Like, and I've had that conversation and I've told them like, hey, to get the result, because if you start it and then it comes up and it's not perfect, then you're taking off attachments like the week before the wedding and then, oh, oh I've been there. I've been there, man. Don't wear <laughs> and it's just like you're doing all this extra coaching for no reason. It's like, hey, let's just maybe do some whitening, right? Get everything nice and white for you for the wedding and the pictures and then we'll straighten everything after. Yeah. Very true. Now, the last two questions here, there's a very common themes from the community. Uh, one is IPR. Like I've done so many like videos now for IPR because this is something that people, uh, when you're starting out, it's a stressful thing. IPR is so stressful. The first time I did IPR, I was like, you know, as a restorative dentist, I felt dirty, you know? It felt like wrong. It feels so, so dirty. So, <laughs> uh, it feels so wrong. And then also the technique and you doubt yourself and you're, you see these horrible radiographs online about uh, IPR gone wrong and you, you just don't want to be that dentist. So I've, I've covered IPR a lot already, but any advice that you have for planning IPR for efficiency that you want to pass on to the community? Yeah. So whenever you see IPR, this is a huge tip. I got this from Dr. Blocker. Um, basically, uh, if you have IPR from K9 to K9 on the mandible, um, and it's 0.2, right? 0.2 all the way across. What you can do is you can actually go into the, like the 3D controls and where you can manipulate where you want to get put IPR. Again, this is what you can do in comprehensive. You can't do this in Invisalign Go. Um, but if you already have a case, what you basically do is you eliminate the IPR and you can just add 0.5 to the mesial of the canines, and then that gets you that millimeter of space that you need, right? So that hack is crazy good because now instead of IPRing so many teeth and trying to be very precise, you just can literally take like the mosquito diamond bird, go to the mesial of the canine underneath the contact, feather swipe up on both of those. There's plenty of enamel on the canine, so you don't have to worry about that. And then you get the space that you need and the teeth move. That's And then if you need more space, you can just do distal of the canine as well. Um, I like to try to preserve the anteriors as much as I can. I try not to do any IPR on the maxillary if I can avoid it. But that is very key just to minimize it, I think, is just redistributing where the IPR goes um, gives you a lot more uh, freedom. Yeah, a lot of people might not realize that you can do that. And that's a really, really great mm-hmm. tip. And especially like, you know, you got like 0.3 here, 0.3 there, 0.4 there. Then group it up into a 0.4 and a 0.5 and, and leave the other one alone. Uh, and then definitely you can do that as long as the, the space that you end up with is, is, is similar or the same. So that's a, a great tip there. And then also, yes, canines in general have such meaty enamel and they are great candidates for IPR. Uh, the only thing, the only caveat here is that if you have a tendency for black triangles, then perhaps then still keep the IPR for those lower sizes which will help the black triangles is, is one thing to, to note there but that's a, a really good top tip there in terms of planning for IPR and the final question Avi is uh, before we just have a little chat is which is and I get this all the time as well which is the best composite for attachments so what do you use for attachments at the moment so I use Tetric Evo Flow um, it's Tetric Evo Flow I was using like a bulk fill 
But my assistant actually requests, because my assistant does my attachments, she requested we go to a, the flowable version of it. So it's Tetric, Evo Flow, and then the flowable. Um, and then I actually did try it out, and um, it is, it's very nice. It's not too like soupy liquidy it's not too um you know meaty to where you can't uh put it uh into the tray but yeah it's we do the foldable version of it and that's great because it's uh it's translucent as well so you really can't see it uh so the patients like that um and then kind of a little bit more composite tips i can dive in here um I mean, in, so a, in a moment, to... it'd be good to learn about your protocol. People ask me, yeah, what's the best way to do my attachment? Yeah. We can talk, we can share, we can share each other's protocols. But one thing I just want to add is I'm at the moment using a genial injectable uh, for okay. it. And I just love how it holds a shape. Like you can literally do anything you want to the template and it just holds its shape so nicely. And uh, I've had no issues with that as well. And that's got, you know, it's a, it's, it's a restorative composite, um, paste mm. composite in a flowable form, if you like. So I have no worries about it wearing away. You know, people say that, oh yeah, um, what if the continual aligner removal insertion is wearing away the attachments? I don't worry about that with Genial. But I think that your one that you recommend, the Tetric Evo uh, Flow, is I think is one of the official uh, ones that, that Invisalign recommend, I believe. Yeah, it probably is because I learned that from a course that I took. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But yeah, it works. It works. Um, yeah, tell us your protocol yeah, for, for attachments. So protocol for attachments, it all starts, so I etch. So I'll etch and it all starts with controlling your etch, right? Because when you do attachments, the biggest thing is you want to minimize the amount of flash that you get, the amount of excess composite that's there. Because if you have that, that will not allow the aligners to seat correctly. And then that is going to obviously cause uh, issues with movements, right? So it starts from the beginning. Control your etch, only etch in the area where the attachment is gonna go, right? So you etch there, normal protocol uh, that you use for etching uh, when you do restorative. I'm treating this essentially like a, you know, like a filling, right? Um, so, but you go to that spot, etch exactly where you need to be, very precise, rinse it off, air dry. And then I'll take well, 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 Whereas so, for restorative, you know, we, we, we want to etch beyond because you want it to, yes. to, to go and get a seamless margin. Uh, for Invisalign, we want to do the opposite. You want to literally contain it within that square or whatever. I completely mm -hmm. agree. Right. So you start there and then bond. With bond, I use like a micro brush to apply it. Um, I believe the bond that I use is Excite. Any bonding is fine. It's just, if you're filling, put it this way, if your fillings are staying intact, it's that's a good etch and bond system to use. Obviously, composites would be a little different, but stick to what you have. You don't have to go buy all the different products. Um, but control the bond as well, right? And, and I like to apply it. At first, I was just using, it was like a pen, and so it had that tip on the edge of it. I don't know exactly what it is, but it was like a I think it's the Iberclaw that brand, that one. I think it's a yes. like black with the yeah. green. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Correct. It's Iberclaw brand. I yeah. was using that at first, but my attachments kept falling off. And the reason was, is that's like an etch and bond in one. It wasn't because of that. It was because of the contamination. So if you take that and you apply it on different teeth, right, saliva can kind of get involved with it. By the time you're on your second or third quadrant, of applying um, that has it's it's not clean anymore right so made a change and I actually just used micro brush and applied a new micro brush in each quadrant so that way there's no chance of saliva really touching it ever since I made that change attachments don't come off so that was key it's control that contamination um, so you put that on you know air dry cure then now what I do is I cut the trays in half Okay, so you go to your incisors, cut them in half for the maxillary and the mandibular. So now you have your four separate trays. This allows you to really ensure that you have a clean working space. If you, you know, if you try to do a whole arch at a time, like that's a lot of isolation that you have to achieve. And if you can achieve it, great. For me, that just it's very difficult to do. And I just like the fact that I can pop it on. You know, um, once I have it on, then I use like uh, the little. I guess we call it college pliers here, just something that you can use to kind of pinch the trays. And you can mm -hmm. just pinch the trays buckle lingual. And what that does is that pushes the composite onto the tooth. And then you cure that. When you do that, um, I guess we can go back to where, how much you fill. I fill right, um, I don't underfill it, I don't overfill it. I try to keep it very level with the trays. It's okay if you're going to go one way, overfill it. Yes. Okay. If you're going to go one way, overfill it because that'll ensure that you capture everything. And you don't have to worry because if you did, if you controlled your etch and you controlled your bond, that composite that's excess will actually just, it should flick right off with the scaler, um, right? Or, or, or whatever bird you may mm -hmm, use to mm -hmm. polish at the end. So you do that, you cure it, and then they're pretty much on. Then the other thing that we use is a black light. 
So you can just get a black light. When you shine black it's light, it's a, on a UV torch. It's something that we're yeah I've advocated before. UV torch and it shows up the flash so well, doesn't it? Correct. Yeah, composite lights up. Then you just go in, remove the flash, um, and then that's pretty much it. And for for that, just a tip. Um, I don't think Genial is as fluorescent. Uh, I think the Tetric one that you recommended is like it goes bright purple, right? When you put the black yeah. torch on it. Yeah. So for the, if you're gonna be if you like the idea of doing this, then I probably would use the uh, the the composite that you recommended. The, the um, just say the name of it. Uh, say say the name of it again. Tetric Evo Flow. That's the one. So if you, if you yeah. like the idea of them shining purple with the black torch or the UV torch, then definitely go for that one. Genial uh, GC products have lower fluorescence and they don't show as well so you might be uh, left disappointed uh, do you use optragate for your isolation um i tried it but it was a little tricky getting in we'll use like an iso dry right so okay. it has basically it'll prop up your one side of the mouth keeps the tongue and everything out of the way and so that's nice and that adds in the whole work in quadrants and halves of the mouth so that's what we use okay no i'm quite a big fan of the optragate it works well in my hands uh the a, a real big issue i had when I started working in this new practice two months, uh, two years ago, is that uh, there's this huge, like five thousand dollar light uh, above us, right? It's like by evidence, it's like really bright, uh, and I didn't realize the the power of this light. And so when I'd be delivering my attachments, by the time I actually just inserted the template, <laughs> the composite occurred, and it. And, and I actually complained to Invisalign saying, hey, all the, the last five patients, the, the templates you're sending, they don't fit the teeth. This is, this is, this is terrible. This is rubbish. You guys, are, you guys suck. But, but, uh, but it, it, was actually, it was actually my fault in the light and I figured out and I actually posted on this on Facebook as well. Like, what's going on? Is anyone else's yeah. attachment templates not fitting? So it's basically the light was prematurely, prematurely curing it. So be careful. If you find as though that when you put your template in, it's not seating that well. It's probably because the composite's just cured, uh, and 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 that's a very a simple tip. thing. Just control your light uh, environment. Uh, that is one thing that's going to definitely save someone. I think eventually we'll, we'll remember this tip uh, and figure it out. Uh, any last words on templates or, not, uh, or attachments? Even I'd say that's pretty much it. I think you stick to that mm -hmm. and ensure they're on. You know, emphasize to the patient, hey, if this, if you feel like anything pops off, uh, let us know, get them in. Because if you don't. If they go too long without an attachment, the tooth isn't going to track and yeah. it's not going to move. So you got to stress that. But other than that, I mean, I, I remember early on, right, when I was uh, starting Invisalign, I do something really stupid and funny, right? So because I didn't <laughs> have faith in in my attachment, because I didn't, because I was I was starting out, I didn't know whether they'd yeah. work. You know, I didn't. Obviously, I was I was stupid because I believe in composite bonding. And why wouldn't I believe it on the facial, the enamel? It was just a stupid thing. But uh, as soon as the patient left after the attachments, I'd go on uh, the doctor website and I'd and I'd preempt the next visit. I'd order a template for appointment five stage five i just order a template <laughs> so by the time the patient come back i would have the template ready just in case and then oh, uh, wow. you realize over time <laughs> don't don't tell them like this uh, uh, but yeah uh, it doesn't cost anything to get to order a template so i thought okay, let me just order a template anyway but yeah i, I, I realized i didn't need it and those templates so those attachments that are going to come away they usually come away within like two days basically and if they Correct. don't come away in the first couple of days they'll stay the long haul they'll go you know mm -hmm. multiple refinements and whatnot we can talk about that another time but uh, Avi I think you've provided great value to everyone listen there you've given those faith who are starting out in Bizline and obviously you've got a bit more experience now you've done more, you know a bit, you've been through all the mistakes and challenges so it's, it's great to have your sort of uh, lessons there please tell us how we can connect with you what services you offer I think you do some coaching and I think a lot of people would appreciate that yeah. please tell us about that pretty much this whole conversation hit everything on the nail uh, in terms of challenges especially for starting off so again i am not like a diamond provider i am not doing you know thousands and thousands of cases i am very much you know um i wouldn't say brand new but i i'm i'm pretty well versed in these initial challenges and i realized right with with cases that the hardest thing is to start right it's the fear of all the things that we just talked about hopefully people listening um you know we've given you some confidence to kind of push forward um you know but again the biggest the big key is having that one-on-one -on -one support right so i created a coaching kind of coaching consulting uh business where i'll work with dentists and help them get started Right. Get them going on the right foot, teaching, you know, how to pick your cases, how to set up your clean checks, how to keep everything predictable to where you're able to really get your feet wet and get comfortable um, and get you to a place where you're doing like 10 cases a month consistently and, and no sweat. And I mean it we're kind of automating you to where it's like, you, you know, you don't have to really stress it. Then after that, it's like you kind of make of it what you want, right? If dentists are comfortable with that, they're great. If they want to further educate themselves, then that's when the courses are incredible. Because 
you can, and this is what I realize. I think a lot of dentists see it too. Is like you can take a course, and it's a phenomenal course. Um, but if you don't even know how to start, that's that information just becomes overwhelming, right? And and you and you and you get lost in that. So, I've kind of created this, and 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 it's helped. It's helped some dentists. Um, they appreciate it, and then. I'm also looking to start to build like a community too, to where people can kind of share and stuff there. Uh, here in America, we have the AACA, American Academy of Clear Aligners. So that's a nice community that I'm a part of. Um, but it does have all ranges of expertise. So it's it's good and it can be a little overwhelming sometimes where if you're brand new, you don't really know what you can ask. So it's that safe I mean, space. Your, your mission is to help those starting out to get started on the right foot, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So h- how do we connect with you if, if someone you know would li- like to learn more? Yeah. So I have, I mean, multiple ways. Instagram is one. My Instagram handle is uh, doctor spelled out dot avi. Um, I have a website for the coaching business. It's called clear aligner advisor dot co. Um, so on there, it has my email, uh, phone number, all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, Instagram or, or on the website are the easiest. For any newbie dentists that are listening, um, I did start a uh, YouTube channel as well, um, just kind of sharing career advice. Not It's not just Invisalign, it's everything. Um, like I said, I was in 10 different offices my first two years out, um, saw dentistry done a bunch of different ways, the good, the bad, the ugly, um, and just kind of sharing my insight. Um, so I have a YouTube channel as well. It's the same thing, Dr. Avi spelled out. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's I fun. look forward I'm, to I'm, subscribing and, and connecting further. I think uh, it's been nice to remind ourselves of the challenges when you're starting out. Uh, and yeah, definitely the, uh, I think the demand for, for just starting out your first few cases is huge. Like mm-hmm. I said, I paid for my first 10 clinic checks to, to get help with those because I was so lacking in confidence in terms of what I was doing. It actually spurred me on to do a whole diploma in orthodontics because the, the, the thought of not knowing enough was, was, was haunting me. And so when you arm yourself with knowledge and get some mentorship uh, in many forms and now online like like you offer is just one of the beautiful things about uh, how we're, we're advancing in dentistry that we can reach out and get mentorship from anyone in the world uh, it's it is cool. amazing so I'll be sure to put your channel link uh, in the show notes uh, and for, if you listen all the way to the end remember that the app is out the protrusive app is out so check it out this video will be on there so for you to enjoy uh, and then you get to see uh, Avi's cool glasses and, and, and his cool shirt uh, <laughs> <laughs> Avi thank you so much for coming on and and sharing your nuggets today mate i really appreciate it i really appreciate it thank you for having me well there we have it guys hope you found that valuable you obviously probably only listen if you actually are starting out with aligners chances are you probably know it didn't reach all the way to the end if you're already quite experienced in providing aligner therapy but if you have for some reason amazing thank you so much for listening all the way to the end and i'll catch you in the next episode listen if you could do me a favor if you found this useful and you know someone else who's starting off with aligners send them this episode and introduce them to the podcast That's how this podcast grows. And I really appreciate your listenership as always. Thank you.